If you were part of that, um, hope you enjoyed it. Today at church, it's great to have you here, or if you're online, great to have you there too. We're in the second week of a series where we're thinking about hope. Where can we find hope? And specifically, we're thinking about the hope that is found in Jesus. And we've got a bit of an interview about a girl who came along to our church, a young lady who came along to our church quite recently, and she found hope. And this is her story. Her name is Jackie. So let's just have a little listen to Jackie and her story. Okay, well, I'm here with Jackie. Jackie, can you just start by telling us about your family and how long you've been coming along to church? Yep, so I'm married with four kids. Um, I've been coming to church since March, so a few months now. Um, yeah. Okay, great. And before that, you came to one of our summer sessions, didn't you? Yep. Can you tell us um, which one that was and how was it? Yep, so I took the girls to the kite making. Um, it was really good. The kids really enjoyed it. They probably did better than what I could do. <laughs> but no, it was really good. Got them involved and they met some friends, so that was good. Terrific. And then uh, this term, you've been coming along to Intro to Jesus on Tuesday nights. Yep. Can you remember what made you want to come along? Yeah, well, I got asked by you at church on my first week um, and then mum also encouraged me to come and then I just decided to turn up. And, and what's it been like? In. It's been really good. Um, I really liked it. So just recently at Incredible Jesus, we thought about a time when a guy came and asked Jesus, what do I have to do to get into heaven? If you can think back to before doing Intro to Jesus, how would you have answered that question? By believing in God. Okay. How I'd say, yeah. That's a pretty good answer, but would, you, would your answer change at all now, having done Intro to Jesus? What would you say now about what you have to do to get yeah. into heaven? Um, now I would say for the power of prayer, um, admitting that you are a sinner, and um, asking Jesus for forgiveness and just knowing that Jesus died for our sins um, and then rose again so that we could have a relationship with him. Great. Now, if there was someone here today kind of maybe thinking about intro to Jesus but not sure whether or not to come along, what would you say to them? I definitely would recommend it. Um, it's a great way to meet people. Um, also, just wanting to learn about Jesus. Everyone is very welcoming and um, knowing, no matter how daunting it may feel when you walk in those doors, you just get a different perspective when you walk in. Everyone's just so welcoming and, um, yeah, it just makes you want to turn up each and every week. Great. Yeah. Thanks so much for that, Jackie, and thanks for sharing with us today. Thank you. That was great, and good on Jackie for having the courage to be interviewed in front of everyone, hey? That's exciting. Now, Intro to Jesus um, is just a course that we're running pretty much every week. It's off for the school holidays, and it'll be starting at the start of next term. It's just out there in the dining room. The first week, there's a fantastic dinner call cooked up by our food team, and each week... For the first half of the course, it's answering kind of big questions people would have about God, like, you know, how do we know there is a God? And did Jesus really exist? And can we trust the Bible? That's the first half of it. And then the second half starts to introduce you to Jesus and looking at the Bible and some of the things that Jesus said. So if that's something that you want to find out about, you want to think more about hope, especially after the talk today, and you want to find out more about Jesus, we would love you, like Jackie, to come along to our Intro to Jesus course. And what Jackie said is... Like what a lot of people are saying, they're a bit daunted about what it might look to come to a church and do a course about Jesus, but it actually turned out to be really good um, and really interesting. The first week's a bit of a try before you buy night, so you can come along for the first week, get a beautiful dinner and dessert, and then decide whether you want to come along to the rest or not. So David has more information about that, and I thought, David, because he's speaking to us today, we might just get to meet him in case you haven't yet, so come on down, David. Now, I forget what I was told. There's COVID mics. Am I allowed to use number two? No, that's Nats. Okay. So I use number one. Perfect. Okay, that's great. Hello, David. <laughs> G'day, Wayne. Hi, everyone. You run the Intro to Jesus course. You're one of the ministers here at the church. 
and you're speaking to us today. That's might right. be good to get to know you a bit. Yep. Because you're yep. not as scary as you look. <laughs> um, yeah. Tell us a bit about your family. I'm married to Sarah. Been married for 18, yeah, not me. 18 years, I think. So nearly 18 years. <laughs> uh, we have six children. Darius is part of the tech team this morning. He's our eldest. He's um, 15 and our youngest is six. They're all excited about school holidays at the moment. Yep. 18 years marriage is nearly 20. That's a big milestone. So let, don't forget the 20. <laughs> Headline yeah. something nice up. Yeah, I'll get that right. Yep. What do you enjoy doing? Like if you've got a day off and the family aren't at school, what's your kind of ideal um, thing to do? Oh, that's a good question. Well, it depends. I mean, in winter, it's um, handy to take the kids firewood cutting. That's always useful. But um, a fun thing that we might do is, um, is either, there's probably two options. One would be like a nice active day and we'd go and play some sport together, maybe go for a walk down by the river. Um, kick a ball around out the back. We love doing that sort of stuff. Or oh, the other extreme is just a lazy day. Watch a movie at home on the projector and eat junk food. So <laughs> it doesn't really matter. I, just spend, I love spending time with the kids. It's Ex good. The extremes of healthy or unhealthy. <laughs> yeah. Love it. Now, yeah. today you're speaking to us about hope. Hmm. And that's a bit of a journey in our lives where we come to think about God and find hope in him. Can you remember where in your life that became really clear that you wanted to um, have a relationship with God and know him and trust him. Can you remember when that was? Oh, yeah, it's tricky. There wasn't probably really a super specific time. I mean, I, fortunately, I, w I was fortunate enough to grow up in a Christian, in a family with parents who were Christians. And so, yeah, I always um, believed in Jesus and, and trusted him. But I, I think probably... Yeah, it's ebbed and flowed, but at university, really, I think, yeah. And I think that was because, I mean, you'll hear in the talk this morning, I made some dumb choices about things. And I think it was at, maybe at university where I was realising, yeah, the direction that my life is going and some of the choices I've made are not, not giving me a great outlook for the future. And so, yeah, maybe the, I think that was probably the big turning point. I mean, there was a bunch of points leading up to that, but thinking, yeah, I need something, someone who's going to give me actually a a confident, uh, uh, something for the future here that I can have confidence in that's in it's not me, and that was, that's Jesus. Mm. It has been ever since. So yeah. whether you grow up in a family where your parents are followers of Jesus and you know the Bible from a young age, or whether you grow up in a family where you don't know anything about God, there comes a point in your life, doesn't there, where you have to actually think, for me, mm. do I want to have a relationship with God and know him? Yeah, yeah that's right. And you'll be thinking about that in the talk today. Yep. That's yep. great. Yep. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks David. So what are we happening for the rest of this morning? That microphone there so they don't get mixed up. Is that we'll be in a little while hearing from the Bible and we'll be hearing a little bit about Jesus and then David will be speaking to us from, from that passage. Then we'll be having a bit of an item. We can't, we can't sing, but Nat is going to sing for us and uh, it's a great song about the goodness of Jesus. And then if you're able, we'd love you to stick around and share morning tea with us, which will be out the back through those doors. But before we do all that... Let's pray together. Just bow your heads with me and you just um, can listen to what I'm saying or if you're comfortable, you can pray it along in your head with me. Our Father in heaven, we thank you. We thank you for your goodness to us. We thank you for this wonderful country that we live in at the moment and the freedom we still have even to meet here right now. We thank you for relationships, for friends, for the people we work with, for family. But most of all, we thank you that in this life, whether things are going well or whether things are not going well, that we can have hope. We can have a certainty to life, a confidence that comes through the death and the resurrection of Jesus. And we pray this morning as we think about Jesus and the claims that he made, you would help us to see clearly how they interact with our lives and the difference that can make for each one of us. So thank you for the chance to stop today and be reminded about what really matters in life. We can get so bogged down in just our daily routine and the pressures around us that we lose sight of you. 
So please this morning lift our eyes to see clearly who you are and who Jesus is and what your plans for this world are. We also particularly pray for people from our church family right now who are struggling, anxious, in pain, unsure about the future. We pray that you would strengthen them, comfort them. We pray that there might be people around them to help them. And we pray that by your spirit, that they might have their eyes fixed on you and be able to live their lives for you. Father, we pray for our government and we pray that they would continue to make good decisions, not just about COVID, but about the finances of our country, the freedoms that we have to meet as your people, education, hospital care, everything. We pray that you would give our government, both state and federal and here in Dubbo, great wisdom in the decisions that they make and help them not to be thinking about themselves, but to be servants and thinking about what's best for your people, not for, for all people, sorry, not just here in Australia, but right around the world. Father, we pray that this morning, especially as Dave comes and speaks to us, we pray that he would be interesting and clear and only speak what is true. Amen. Okay, we're going to read from the Bible now. If you do have a Bible, you're welcome to follow along. If you don't have a Bible, that's fine. Just listen along. If you've got a phone, you can find the phone app onto the Bible. Uh, Ruth's going to read it for us. Thank you, Ruth. And after that, uh, Dave will be up here and help us to think about the passage. We're reading from Matthew chapter 1, starting at verse 18. This is how the birth of Jesus, the Messiah, came about. His mother Mary was pledged to be married to Joseph, but before they came together, she was found to be pregnant through the Holy Spirit. Because Joseph, her husband, was faithful to the law and yet did not want to expose her to public disgrace, he had in mind to divorce her quietly. But after he had considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife, because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus, because he will save his people from their sins. One thing I just forgot. This morning, the year three to six are in with us. You are so quiet, I hardly noticed that you were there, but now I look around and I can see you all. Megan, our kids worker, has some special worksheets for you. So if you would like to come over here quietly, um, we'll give you a couple of, a minute or so to do it. Do it right now. There's some little worksheets. Look, Megan even had one right here for me, and I still forgot. So there's some quizzes on that part of the Bible and some things to do. So head over here, grab one. Um, adults, you just might want to say good day to the person next to you, and Dave will be up in about a minute. All right. When I was uh, in high school, <clears throat> one weekend, mum and dad and my brother and sister uh, went away for the weekend. They, went to, they all went to Sydney and I stayed home on my own. Now, what happened that weekend is something that I'm not proud of. What happened is that... Um, after mum and dad went to Sydney, I invited my 
uh, buddies from school around for some fun. And mum and dad didn't know they were coming. It started off okay. We had a swim in the pool in the backyard. We played a few computer games. But at some point during the evening, I don't know how it happened, I don't know where we got it from, but we got our hands on some alcohol and we all got drunk. And we started acting like absolute clowns. Running around our quiet little cul-de-sac, carrying on into the middle of the night. There were people throwing up in the gutter, keeping everyone awake. At one point in the early hours of the morning, I, I still don't know why we thought it would be fun, but we thought it would be fun to vandalise someone's front yard. The neighbours called the police and I came this close to being charged and having a criminal record. I am not at all proud of what I did. In fact, I regret it deeply to this day. I am deeply, deeply ashamed of the way that I carried on. I'm deeply ashamed of the damage and the hurt that I caused. And just even thinking about it this week and talking about it now makes me feel sick in my stomach. It makes me feel incredibly guilty. And look, friends, my guess is I'm not alone in feeling like that. My guess is that we've all done things that we regret. My guess is that you've done things that you're ashamed of as well. My guess is you've done things that make you feel guilty. Things that, even when you think of them now, make you feel sick in the pit of your stomach. If you do feel at all like that, if you know the kind of feelings that I'm talking about, then today is a good day to be here. Because today, like Wayne said, it's the second in our series of four talks all about hope. And what we're going to see today is that the great news from the Bible is that for people who have regrets and for people who are guilty and for people who are full of shame, there is hope. There is hope of being rescued from our guilt. There is hope of being set free from shame and regret. What we're going to see today is that the reason we can have hope is because Jesus has come to save us from our sins. This is the very last sentence that Ruth read to us just before. This is what a messenger said to uh, Jesus' father, Joseph, just before he was born. Mary will give birth to a son and you are to give him the name Jesus because he will save his people from their sins. It's the very last few words in that sentence that give us hope. Jesus will save his people from their sins. That right there is the source of hope for people who have regrets. That is the source of hope for people who are guilty and for people who are filled with shame. But the question is, what does it even mean? Jesus will save his people from their sins. What is that actually talking about? And more importantly, how does that give us hope? Well, for the rest of our time now, we're going to work our way through that sentence, figuring out what it means and thinking about how it gives us hope. The first thing to get clear in that sentence is that idea of sin. So it says there, Jesus will save his people from their sins. So what is sin? Well, I reckon if you ask most people at the shops or at work or something like that, what they think sin is, most people think that sin is something like just being a bit naughty. It's indulging a little bit. There might be things like lying or stealing or going over the speed limit or having an extra scoop of ice cream or an extra glass of wine in the evening. You know, things that are a bit naughty, but in the grand scheme of things, things that don't really matter that much. It's not really a big deal. Friends, that is not what the Bible says about sin. That is not God's view of sin. This is more like how the Bible describes sin. We all, like sheep, have gone astray. Each of us has turned to our own way. That idea there of going astray, that idea of turning our own way, that's really what the Bible calls sin. Here's another verse that says the same thing, but it's even clearer here. 
It says, there is no one righteous, not even one. There is no one who understands. And now listen to this bit. There is no one who seeks God. All have turned away. So there it is again, clearer this time, the idea of turning away from God, of wanting to have nothing to do with him. That is sin. Sin is ignoring God. It's living as though he doesn't exist. It's treating God as though he's outdated and irrelevant. Sin is living life your own way without God. Sin is effectively saying to God, I don't want you, I don't need you, leave me alone. Now, here's the thing about sin. We all do it. At some point or another, we all treat God like that. We all ignore him at times. We have all turned away from him. We all sin. Have a look at these passages again. We all, like sheep, have gone astray. Each of us has turned to our own way. Pretty clear there, isn't it? It says we have all gone astray. Each one of us, at some point in our lives, has turned away from God and turned to our own way. Here it is again. There is no one righteous, not even one. There is no one who understands. There is no one who seeks God. All have turned away. That is pretty clear, isn't it? There is no one who treats God rightly all of the time, not even one. We have all, every single one of us here in this room, at some stage in our lives, we have all turned away from him. And that is a big problem. Sin is a big problem because it leads to guilt and shame and regret. But even more than that, Far more than that, sin is a big problem because when we treat God like that, it is deeply offensive to him and it rips apart our relationship with him. And without God, we are cut off from the one who made us. Without God, we are cut off from the one who can forgive us and give us eternal life. Without God, we are destined to face death and judgment and hell, sin is a massive problem. So what's the solution? Is there a solution? Well, look, friends, the solution isn't to try harder or do better. The solution isn't to pull your socks up and get your life in order. The solution isn't to be good or to help more people or to be more generous. The solution isn't to stop lying and stealing and cheating. The solution isn't to stop indulging or to stop being naughty. I mean, it's good to do those things, don't get me wrong. But in the end, doing those things, it really only covers over the symptoms. It doesn't deal with the real problem. A little while back, I had a saw up here on the top of my head. And it just wouldn't go away. No matter what I did, it wouldn't heal. So I started covering, up with a, uh, covering it up with a Band-Aid. Didn't help. It still didn't get any better. The sore was still there underneath. So eventually, after about 18 months, I went to the doctor. <laughs> Turns out it was a skin cancer. Now, you don't need me to tell you that covering up a cancer with a band-aid, that is just dumb. <laughs> it's not going to do anything, is it, right? What I needed was for the doctor to cut the cancer out altogether. And that's what he did. Friends, sin is like a cancer in our lives. We can try and be good. We can try and do better. But in the end, that's just like putting a band-aid over a cancer. It does not and it will not and it cannot work. It looks good on the surface, but underneath it hasn't fixed the problem at all. What we really need is to get rid of the cancer altogether. What we really need is to get rid of sin altogether. What we really need is for someone to rescue us from the dumb choices we make. What we really need is for someone to save us from the consequences of ignoring God 
and to bring us back into a good relationship with God again. So how does that happen? Well, back to our sentence. Remember our sentence from earlier? Have a look at how it begins. Jesus will save his people from their sins. Jesus will save from sins. Friends, that is great news. That is the reason, that the thing that gives us hope. I mean, let's think about how Jesus does this. Our problem, remember, is our sin. Our problem is ignoring God. God's plan, his solution is to rescue us from our sin. And his plan is to do that through Jesus. The way that Jesus does that is by dying in our place. He faces the consequences of our choices. He pays the penalty for our sin. See, as we read on in Matthew, it becomes obvious that all along it was always Jesus' plan to go to Jerusalem and to be put to death on a cross so as to pay for sin. So this is from about halfway through Matthew. Jesus here is talking about the fact that he must go to Jerusalem and he must die. Jesus began to teach his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things at the hands of the elders, the chief priests and teachers of the law and that he must be killed and on the third day be raised to life. So you can see there that Jesus, uh, Jesus knew all along that he was heading to Jerusalem and he was heading there to die. That was his plan all along, to face the consequences of our choices, to pay the penalty for our sin. And right at the very end of Matthew, that is exactly what happened. Jesus died. About three in the afternoon, Jesus cried out in a loud voice, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And when Jesus had cried out again in a loud voice, he gave up his spirit. So Jesus died there in Jerusalem. And you will have noticed that it says there that he died God forsaken. And he deliberately did that so as to fulfill God's plan. God's plan, remember, that said Jesus will save his people from their sins. When Jesus died on the cross, it wasn't an accident. He wasn't a helpless victim. He wasn't getting what he deserved. He wasn't dying for his own sins. He didn't have any sins. When Jesus died on the cross, he was deliberately and willingly dying for the sins of others so as to save them from their sins. It's a little bit like this. Imagine this hand is me and, you know, God's up there somewhere. And this book, suppose this book is a record of all my sins. I've got the fattest book I could find. In this book is every lie that I've told, every lustful thought that I've had. There's all the times that I've gotten angry and yelled at the kids there's the time that I stole a chocolate from the tennis club when I was a boy. There's that time I was talking about before when I had my friends around and we got drunk when mum and dad were away. In here is all the times I've been selfish, all the times I've thought bad things about other people. In here is absolutely every time that I've ignored God and tried to live life my way without him. Now, as you can see, this book that has a record of all my sins, it's here between me and God. And because of that, I can't get near him. I can't have a relationship with him. I was made to have a relationship with God, but because of my sin, I'm separated from him and I'll stay that way unless something is done about my sin. Now, on the other hand, imagine this is Jesus. He's got no book of sin. He lived in the real world that we do. He was tempted in all the same ways that we are, but he didn't sin. He always lived with God at the centre of his life, in his words, in his thoughts, in his actions. Jesus has a perfect, 
open relationship with God. Now, here's what happened when Jesus died on the cross. He deliberately and willingly chose to take this book of my sin and take it on himself. He stood in my place. He faced the consequences for my dumb, selfish, sinful choices. And God poured out the just penalty for all of my sin and he poured it out on Jesus. And Jesus was destroyed there on the cross. He died God forsaken. But do you see? Because of what Jesus did, because of his death covered in my sin, now there's nothing between me and God. Now I can come near to God. Now I am forgiven by God. Now I can have a relationship with God again. Now Jesus has saved me from my sin. Now I am free from all that regret that goes with that sin. Now I'm free from all that guilt and shame that comes with my sin. Friends, can you feel the relief of having that? I mean, on one level, that was a heavy book. It was making my arm feel sore. I can feel the relief of that. But how much more the relief of being free from that guilt and shame and regret? Can you feel the deep hope that it brings? What we're thinking about this morning, this is the best news that you will ever hear. And actually, what we've seen today is that there is hope for anyone who has regrets. There is hope for anyone who is guilty. There is hope for anyone who is filled with shame. Because remember our sentence? Jesus will save his people from their sins. His people, Jesus' people, that is anyone who comes to him and asks for forgiveness. Friends, you can be one of his people. You can have your sins forgiven. You can have hope. You know, when my parents got home from that trip to Sydney, I was scared. I thought there was no hope. I thought there was no way they would ever forgive me. I thought there was no hope things could ever be right again. And look, they were obviously massively disappointed. And when I owned up to what I'd done, it hurt. It hurt me. And even worse, it hurt them. But you know, owning up to it was actually the best thing. Because once I owned up to it, I could ask them to forgive me. And the, the delightful thing was that when I admitted what I'd done... And when I asked mum and dad to forgive me, they forgave me like that. Friends, I don't know exactly what you have to regret. I don't know just how guilty you are. I don't know how deep and far-reaching your shame is. But I don't need to know. It actually doesn't matter. Because the hope that's being held out to us today is that no matter what you've done, If you own up to it and if you say sorry to God, if you accept that Jesus has paid the penalty for it, if you ask God to forgive you, the hope that is being held out to us today, the sure and certain hope, is that God will absolutely forgive you and your sin will be paid for in full. It will be gone. It will be no more. And friends, then you can really start the process of healing from all that regret and guilt and shame. Look, I'm going to pray a prayer now. This is the kind of prayer that you'd pray to become one of Jesus' people. The kind of prayer that you'd pray to have your sins forgiven. I'm going to pray, I'm going to admit my sin, I'm going to ask for forgiveness and I'm going to say thank you. The prayer is here on the screen. If you want to pray it as well, just say the words after me, quietly in your, yeah, between you and God. I'll leave a space after each bit. Let's pray.
God, I know I've done wrong. I know I've ignored you. I know I haven't treated you like I should. I'm sorry. Can you please forgive me? Thank you that Jesus died on the cross and that he rose back to life to save me from my sins. Amen. Thank you, David. I can remember a few years ago, we had some people from church at seven uh, out to our place for a movie night. And after the movie finished, it was an outdoor movie night, we're sitting on the back of the um, grass out the back of our house. Uh, We started watching the stars and there were some guys there who were really into star watching and they were pointing out the various stars. And so ever since then, Um, I've been taking an interest in, you know, where's Jupiter and uh, where's Mars or whatever and sometimes pull out the app and look at the sky. And I don't know if you've noticed, but when the moon's out and the the night sky's a bit bright, it's harder to make out the stars. But on the dark nights, when the moon's not there, you can see the stars most clearly. And I felt that was a little bit like today's talk. It was, did you feel it was a bit heavy? Maybe at times even a bit uncomfortable as it dug into our lives but it's only when we're that honest when we see the mess that we are in before God that we can actually see clearly the hope that Jesus brings the goodness of Jesus so I hope if anything as we've sat in the discomfort of our rejection of God today that in the midst of that you have seen clearly the goodness of God that that he actually wants to reach out to us and offer us forgiveness And if that's something that you felt you wanted to take that step of following Jesus today and you prayed that prayer, please come and talk to myself, come and talk to David, Uh, come along to the Intro to Jesus course. Or if you're online and you're watching and you're wondering what the next step is, on our website, if you scroll down the bottom, there's a little button that says, Get Connected. And you can email us and we'll get a, a lady or a man from church to get in contact with you there. But we would love to help you just explore what it means to follow Jesus. Uh, Today's really been about where hope begins. It starts with Jesus. Next week, in our third week on our hope series, we'll be thinking about um, how having our hope in Jesus changes this life and the things that we value in this life. And then in the fourth week, we'll be thinking about how our hope goes into eternity and the difference it makes for the next life. So please come come back if you can. But today's been all about forgiveness and the goodness of Jesus And before we head to morning tea, we're just going to take a moment to reflect on that as Nat sings for us. And uh, Nat's um, from Church at 11 here. Nat's going to sing for us the goodness of Jesus. So just sit back and reflect on these words. Just 
Thank you, Nat. And thank you, everyone, for joining us today. Um, I hope that you've seen clearly that hope is found in the goodness of Jesus. And um, if that's something that's new for you today, please come and talk to myself or David if you'd like to find out more. We're going to, uh, we can thankfully still have morning tea, isn't that great? So if you'd like to head out through the doors, grab morning tea around the back of the kitchen. You are allowed to come into the dining room um, if it's a bit cold out there, but if you are in the dining room, you need to be seated. Otherwise, God willing, we'll see you next week. Check your emails on Saturday night in case there's any last minute COVID rule changes, but we'll see you next Sunday. Thank you for coming.